And we're now coming to one of the most anticipated parts of the evening, a presentation by Bob Kelly. And I've heard him speak before. I think you're going to find his presentation very interesting. To formally introduce Bob, I'd like to ask Robert Steele to come forward. Rob is president and CEO of Newfoundland Capital Corporation Limited and a high profile member of many business and charitable ventures around the city. Uh, he's also head of the second largest private sector chain of radio stations. So if you're not listening to CBC, maybe you're listening to one of his. I, I listen. Okay, we all do. Um, and if he looks familiar, you may have seen his face on some Metro Transit buses, part of the allnovascotia.com ad campaign. <laughs> Mr. Rob Steele. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Norma Lee. I appreciate it very much. And it's certainly a pleasure to be here tonight to introduce our guest speaker, who was inspirational and dynamic, and I'm very looking forward to his talk. Clearly, many in the audience have close connections here to St. Mary's University, a cross-section of high-profile individuals in banking and finance can trace their roots back to those stone buildings up there on Roby Street. Our guest speaker, Bob Kelly, credits one professor for pushing him into accounting, a direction that he hadn't previously considered. While the push by Professor Howard Beasley was clearly in the correct direction, and once Bob got going, he hasn't stopped. Bob is one of North America's leading financiers. He is chairman and CEO of BNY Mellon. He has repeatedly been named one of the top CEOs in North America, and his company manages assets in excess of a trillion dollars. This is staggering. They have 23 trillion in custody. And his advice is sought by financial leaders across the globe. But to meet Bob, as we are tonight, and he can't help but be struck by his humility and his informal style. He may be Dr. Robert P. Kelly when he dons the robes and performs his duties as Chancellor of the University. But at the board table, and in pleasant conversation, it's simply Bob. Bob carries his informal leadership style into the business and shares his ideas openly with BNY Mellon's 50,000 employees. He hosts town halls for employees all over the world and also authors an extremely popular employee blog. Bob shows commitment to open and frequent communication. His leadership style is informal, open door, collegial, but yet results based. He has earned a Bachelor of Commerce degree from St. Mary's University in 1975 and was awarded an honorary doctorate of commerce in 1997. Bob helped create the first Commerce Society banquet 37 years ago. The students are glad to have him here tonight so they can show him how far they have taken this event. So please, folks, a round of applause. Please welcome Mr. Bob Kelly. Thank you, sir. Well, hi, everyone. So I understand I have uh, three hours to speak. Everyone looked really distressed when I said that at my table about 10 minutes ago. Uh, it's great to be home, and uh, I don't get to do it as often as I'd like, so it's really terrific. And uh, Rose is with me tonight, my wife of 29 years. Uh, I mentioned to a few people at lunch today that one of the great things of being here, of course, besides uh, helping to support St. Mary's and the, uh, and the students is it's a Friday, so I get to stay for the whole weekend in Halifax. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that sounds pretty boring, but I, it's something that I kind of like a lot, which is uh, competitive advantages, about how you create advantages over time in a global community. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about globalization for a couple of minutes, then we'll talk about uh, competitive advantages maybe that Canada has, and then maybe a couple of messages for the students, and we'll be out of here by midnight. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, probably the biggest single change that has occurred during my career is the creation of a global playing field for companies and for labor. 
and, uh, and beyond, uh, beyond anything I could have imagined, uh, certainly uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Now, I know what a lot of you younger people are thinking here. It, globalization, it probably, for Bob, wouldn't have been like the creation of the automobile or <laughs> the printing press or something like that. Uh, but the reality is, we, this is the biggest we have witnessed, if you're at least 16 years old, you've been alive for probably the biggest capitalist shift in the history of the human race. And um, I read an amazing article, probably the best article I've read in the last five years, it was an article uh, by a guy by the name of Richard Freeman. Uh, at Harvard, and he wrote a, an article called The Great Doubling. And it had two criteria that I really love in academic work. Firstly, it teaches you something you really didn't know before. And secondly, it was really short, uh, which I liked. You know, and the Harvard thing's cool, too, because it sounds impressive. And, and, and by the way, um, I have with me tonight one of my cousins who graduated from the Harvard Business School, Paul Cormier, 60 years ago this year. Paul, just stand up and wave to everybody. <clears throat> so, hey, Paul our former Auditor General for the province. So here was, here's the basic pitch. If you haven't heard this before, it's really short, but it's kind of amazing. So in 1990, when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, roughly at that time, there was about a billion and a half people on the planet who were in the business of capitalism, okay? And over the next five years, it basically doubled to three billion people, which is kind of astonishing that it happened that quickly. Of course, that was the addition of China in India and Eastern Europe and all those sort of countries. And it was combined with the confluence and the vast improvement in, uh, in uh, computer and communications technology. And of course, they converged. And the, the impact was absolutely astonishing. So, um, so I was looking at a stat yesterday on my really cool iPad. And, um, and it was about internet usage in China. China is now the biggest internet users on the planet. So in 2010, there were 420 million internet users in China. Number two country in the world is the United States with 240. So 420 million. Anyone want to guess how many there were 10 years ago? Close to zero. It's 20 million. So they managed to add 400 million users <laughs> over the last 10 years. And it's kind of astonishing. So I was thinking about that, like just try to imagine it. And uh, as I was kind of thinking about that yesterday at lunchtime while writing my notes for you folks tonight, I had this Blackberry, right? So I'm looking at my Blackberry, and I was kind of staring at this. And of course, this is the RIM, which is one of the great Canadian technology stories, perhaps one of the greatest ever. It's fantastic. In spite of the fact they had a tough day in the market today. But that's OK. They'll get through that. Uh, so I open up the back of it. And I started looking at this thing. So uh, I don't know what yours said. This is, mine's the bold. And uh, it, it says made in Mexico. And then, the, uh, and then there's this chip for a uh, video chip, right, for, uh, for storage. That said made in Japan. And then there is the phone chip, which says uh, Verizon on it, which of course is American. And it also says Vodafone, which is of course European. And uh, I didn't want to tear apart the rest of my Blackberry. <laughs> Uh, but I got that far, right, in just like 30 seconds and looking at the back of this thing. So it just reminds you of just how global things have become. Uh, you don't have to go very far from that. Think about, um, think about the Middle East. Think about three months ago imagining to see the tectonic changes, these shifts, the incredible shifts that we've seen uh, that has occurred in so many countries in the Middle East, everywhere from, uh, from Morocco, of course, to Egypt, Libya, in eastern Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Jordan, Syria, on and on and on and on and on. And Tunisia, of course, which more or less started it. And what really caused that? Well, you, you were listening to the TV and reading the blogs just like me. You know, it, it was due to the internet and to Facebook, right? And it was due to cell phones and Blackberries and things like that. Everyone knows everything all the time now and people there can see that their lives can be better if it was different. And it's just astonishing to see. Uh, globalization has really affected our company, and it's really affected my job. 
Um, ten years ago, uh, we had, of our 50,000 people, uh, we had about 20% of our profits and 20% of our people outside of the U.S. And then by uh, 2007, it was about 32%. And then last quarter, it was about 40%. And probably within the next three to five years, uh, we will probably be more international or global than we are American in terms of where our clients are and where our staff are. That's a huge shift very quickly. And it kind of reminded me of uh, the fact that I probably travel anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the time. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in India for a week where we have a lot of clients and 6,000 staff. Uh, which is really fun to visit them. And, uh, and then I came back and I called up my son, who's 25 years old. And my son was, uh, our son, was, uh, was, was <laughs> sorry. Whew. I suddenly got tense there for a second. Um, so, I, you know, so my son's 25, he's an engineer, lives in Los Angeles, was born in London, grew up in Canada, um, and I happened to mention to him during the course of the conversation that you can hire really, really, really smart engineers in India for $5,000 a year. <laughs> he makes over $100,000 a year. So, you know, I, I, there was this long pause and then I think I heard this kind of like, kind of like a nervous giggle over the phone. But, you know, the whole point is uh, globalization is really real and it's not going away. So. Um, in that environment, Canada has, in my view, some terrific competitive advantages. And uh, I'll just list a couple of them. I'm into data. I'm a data guy. Um, so as you think about it, firstly, the education system. People love to complain about their education systems, including here in Canada. But if you think about the OECD data, uh, Canada currently is rated number five in math and number two in science. In the U.S., uh, in math, we're rated 35, and in science, rated 29, which is a little bit of an issue. So the bottom line is we in Canada are producing globally competitive workers, and we get to do a little better, so through the 49th parallel. And I should add that Canada, of course, has fantastic universities. Some of the finest of them are in, here in Nova Scotia, and definitely the best one is uh, St. Mary's University. <laughs> You know, let's be honest about it, right? So uh, my wife went to Dell. <laughs> so we're still working through that, but it's, it's fine. Um, so let's, let's talk about financial health of the, uh, of the uh, well, before we, maybe before we talk about, yeah, maybe we should. Let's talk about um, federal deficits. So right now, our deficits in Canada are about 1.7% of everything we produce. And in the United States, it's about 11% of everything we produce, which is extraordinarily high. So think about if you make $100,000 a year, in Canada, it's like 1.7, it means that you're taking out an extra $1,700 in debt every year. In the United States, for the same job, you're taking out an extra $11,000 in debt every year. It's, uh, Canada's in really good shape. Basically, if you can keep it below 3%, you're gonna basically be growing that deficit and your debt slower than your country's growing. And uh, the U.S. has got to come to grips with that, and they haven't done that yet. You guys basically already have. So you're in really good shape, and there's kind of two big drivers of that. And uh, the first one is uh, health care costs. And you guys are in great shape on that. Uh, health care as a percentage of everything you produce, GDP, can in uh, Canada is about 10% of GDP. And most Western countries in the world is about 10%, maybe 11%. In the United States, it's uh, 16 or 17 percent. It's, uh, it's a really bad healthcare system unless you're rich. And uh, so most people, it's just a really inefficient system. And uh, so that means that uh, Canada can take that 6 percent differential and invest it in other ways, like building hockey rinks, right? And, <laughs> and uh, or even better, like curling rinks, which I used to love to do here at the Mayflower Club. Um, and, uh, but that's a, don't underestimate that. It's, it's a huge factor and it's what's really playing to a lot of the cost increases that you're seeing in the deficits in the U.S. 
Um, I don't know if you know, but Canadians live two years longer on average than Americans. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Maybe you're just nicer people and friendlier and more laid back and richer now, of course, which is nice. Um, so um, so the at life expectancy at birth right now for males is, uh, is 81 in Canada, so like 79 in the U.S. And uh, for Canadian women, uh, life expectancy now, I guess, would be about 300 years. And... Uh, <laughs> Which is so unfair. There's obviously something you guys aren't sharing with us, and but we'll come back to that maybe later. Um, and um, so the the uh, deficit situation is well under control. And the healthcare situation is not a drag to the country, and uh, and of course the other big thing is pension costs. And you guys are doing a good job there too, because of course with CPP you're pre-funding it, and you have 140 billion dollars now, and that's building up a nice nest egg. And in the U.S., we're uh, you know we're kind of doing as pay as you go, which means that we haven't funded it at all, and that's not a good thing. And uh, but that's fixable, right? You just got to think about what the benefits are and what retirement age should be. So to put that in perspective, uh, when Social Security came in in the U.S. in 1935. Uh, the average male, well, let me tell you the age, of course, retirement age was 65 then. It still is 65. And uh, the average life expectancy for males in the United States at that time in 1935 was 65, <laughs> right? So now, of course, for men, it's like 81, right? For women, it's 300. And you, you just can't afford it anymore. So at some point in the future, this is really bad news for all the students here who will be working, you know, to save us for many, many decades in the future, and we really want to thank you. Uh, it's, um, it, it's really kind of amazing because, you know, retirement age has got to start with a seven at some point, and probably the benefits will be less in the future than they are today, but Canada's doing a nice job on that. The other thing is corporate tax rates. So we're in, um, 30, we're in 36 countries around the world with our 50,000 people, and uh, of those, countries, until two years ago, the United States had the second highest corporate tax rate, second only to Japan in the world. So it was like the worst place to earn a, a dollar of profit would have been in Japan, because uh, basically 40% of it would be taken away by taxes. And uh, so last year, the United States moved up to the number one spot, uh, the worst highest corporate tax rate in the world, at uh, about 41%. So uh, Canada, of course, if you've been following the debate, which really started in last August, Canada is slowly going down over the next few cent, percent. That's a big competitive advantage over your nearest partner and friends, which of course are in the United States. And that means that you get to bring 75 cents or every dollar in profit down to the bottom line. That is a big competitive advantage and slowly, slowly, it looks like 25% is becoming like the global corporate tax rate. And uh, we're just not competitive enough in the U.S. and all that. So uh, you got a lot of advantages, including a resilient financial system. And uh, let's not forget, you got a great democracy. We'll see how you on this one on <laughs> announced today. It's a fairly great democracy. Um, and uh, combined with vast natural resources that are worth, of course, amazing things. So you, over the last 10 years, you've done a great job at creating a lot of jobs, creating a lot of wealth having healthier and happy people, and of course, a stronger dollar. When I moved to the U.S. in 2000, a Canadian dollar uh, was worth 63 cents, right? So now it's worth uh, almost a buck three. And that is the best vote about how well your country is doing. The value of the currency of your country is getting stronger. So Canada has a lot to be proud of, but you can't sit on your laurels, and uh, you gotta keep ahead. Uh, so, um, and by the way, I gave a lot of stats against the U.S. because I know all the U.S. stats, but don't think I am, uh, I'm being negative on the U.S. The U.S. is still 25% of the GDP of the planet, and that's the country that created Google, Facebook, Apple, you know, the greatest technology companies on the planet over the last 10 years. We've got a few issues in Washington we've got to work on, and uh, let's hope we do it in the near term because uh, I think... Uh, Someone really, really smart told me recently that foreigners were going to keep buying our bonds until they stopped. <laughs> so I thought that was fairly profound, right? I said, yeah, you're right. Can, can I write that down? Uh, 
but it's kind of true, you know, uh, you're watching all this stuff going on in Europe right now, right, with Portugal and Greece and Ireland and uh, in Spain and, you know, and the pig countries, as they call them, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, but the United States isn't that far behind. We've got to get this fixed over the next couple of years, and you guys are already in good shape. So um, I think Canada is in really good shape here, and uh, you just got to stick with it. And I think uh, you have, you're going to, uh, over time, you should outperform the global economy. Uh, so let's kind of end on this. And I understand I have time for another hour of questions after that. Um, so some advice for students. Uh, and that would be create your own competitive advantages. Uh, in my own career, I only really ever cared about two kind of general things. Firstly, I wanted to get a really good education because I honestly thought that at the margin, if you're in a, in a job situation where you're in an interview, everything else being equal, the person with the better education was probably going to get the job. So, um, and then I recognized people with more education tended to make more money than people with less. So uh, that's why after I uh, graduated from St. Mary's, I did the CA and also the MBA, and, um, which is kind of a little bit weird because uh, I love to learn, but I hate to study. But, but I did recognize it was a path to something better, and, uh, and I did that. So in my, um, in my working career, um, I've, uh, I would just have two pieces of advice, maybe, maybe three. Um, firstly, enjoy what you do. Uh, Life is really, really, really short, so uh, don't do something you don't like, right? The other thing is people who like what they do tend to really outperform the people who don't like what they do. And, um, and then uh, I would say to you, be optimistic in what you do. Uh, I've never met a successful entrepreneur or CEO uh, who's a pessimist. It, they just don't exist. Uh, they can be realists, right, when things are ugly, but in the end, they have an innate belief that things will be okay and we'll figure out how to get there. Uh, so I really recommend that you kind of think about that if you're a student. And uh, last thought, uh, never compromise your values, ever. So if someone comes to you and asks you to do something that you know is a bad thing, don't do it. Because, uh, because it's like being in a family, right? When you're in a family situation, if someone loses their trust in you, takes a long time to regain it. So I'm glad you're getting a great education. Be optimistic, have great values, and have a great evening. Thank you.